folks, friends, welcome to Daily Power Parsha, December 31st, 2020. We began this way back in March of 2020. We're going now on nine and a half months, nine and a half months of Daily Power Parsha. I was looking through the online archives last night on SoundCloud, and I noticed something very cool that the... Um, DPP, at least the recordings that I have, begin with Vayikra, with Leviticus. Um, hold on one second. Let me get my screen to where I like it. Hold on. Hold on, everybody. Um, anyway, I have DPP as beginning in... Hold on. In Leviticus which means, here we go, which means that we have, um, we've done Leviticus, we've done Numbers, we've done Deuteronomy, the Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and now Genesis, we're wrapping up Beratius, and then we have Exodus to go. I'm not saying we're gonna stop then, but, this should be this should be exciting as we um, as we roll on. All right, I'm just trying to get my screen situated. I'm here in the started, office, and I had a. It's been helpful since we started after Rosh Hashanah with the new cycle, so to have the the history from the beginning. From the beginning, yeah, yeah that's 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 how we like to get. Yeah, it's good to start in the middle, but it's also good to start at the beginning. <laughs> you can't go wrong, can't go wrong with that. Okay, let me try one more time to get this to work for me. I'm at the office and I have this plugged in, but I'd like to be able to look at my screen and look at you and not look in a different direction. Let me see if this is gonna work. No, how do we do this? Okay, maybe this is gonna work. We shall see. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna share my screen. After much ado, Okay, so this power parsha Torah portion is Vayechi, and I'm going to share my screen with you so that we can all be on the same page. Let's see, share screen. You'd think after nine and a half months this would be smooth, and it usually is, but okay, here we go. All right, Vayechi, today is Thursday, so Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, today is the fifth reading. So our portion, we were in middle of Jacob's blessings to his children. Jacob blessed his children, um, each one in their own way. Some didn't look like so much of a blessing, but nonetheless, blessings in their own right, or at least prophecies about his children. Jacob is on his deathbed. He is imminently going to pass away, and he wishes to encourage, inspire, bless, or sometimes even chastise his children before he is gone. Genesis chapter 49, verse 19, let's continue. As for God, God is the next son, the next tribe, if you will, to be discussed, a troop will troop forth from him, and it will troop back in its tracks. Okay, there's a lot of troops, right? I bet you haven't said that word troop in a while. A troop will troop forth, and it will troop back in its tracks. Lots of trooping. So what's a troop? Here we go. Take a look at Rashi. Rashi says, here we go. Um... Let's look at the end of this really long Rashi. A lot of this Rashi is involved in the in the grammar, in the Hebrew grammar, but let's pick it up at the end that I just highlighted because that gets to the concept of what it's talking about. So this phrase, troops, troop, troops trooping forth. So troops will troop forth from him. What does that mean? They will cross the Jordan with their brothers to war every armed man until the land is conquered. But you know this because we started in the <laughs> we started in the middle and we ended the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. Remember when two and a half tribes approached Moses and said, hey, we want to stay here. 
on the other side of the Jordan. We don't want to go into Israel because this is good land for cattle. And Moses is like, no, you're making the same mistake not wanting to go into Israel. Like, no, 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 no. We're, we're not saying not to go in. And we'll fight. We'll, we'll, we'll be soldiers in, in the conquering of the land of Israel. We just want to settle this land because it's got good grain. And I even told you they had a hidden agenda. They, want, they didn't want to abandon Moses. They wanted to be with Moses because he was going to be buried there. We discussed this before several months ago. Anyway, the point is that God is being blessed now years, hundreds of years earlier, literally 200 years earlier, God is being blessed by Jacob as being the, as being the tribe of troops because they will be the ones to troop to fight, to conquer the land, but not even for themselves, for their brothers. And then they're going to troop back and resettle or live on the other side of the Jordan. And that's what it means. It will troop back to his tracks. All his troops of the tribe of, of God will return in their tracks to the territory that they took on the other side of the Jordan, and no one will be missing from them, which means they'll all go into battle, and they'll all return safely in battle. I need to tell you a story that really doesn't have to do with this, but it's a story that comes to mind that I need to share. So I think you've all met, met my grandfather, right? Yeah, you've all met my grandfather. So he had a twin brother who passed away a decade or two ago, uh, probably going on 20 years or so. And so my grandfather was studying in the Chabad Yeshiva. This is in the 1940s. This is before Chabad was cool. I'm kidding. Chabad was always cool. But this is before, like, it was, you know, a household name. So the previous Rebbe came over from Europe. He was in Russia. And then Russia kicked him out because they didn't like what he was doing. They wanted to kill him. But eventually they said, all right, we'll let you live. But you can't live here anymore. So he, he moved to Poland Warsaw, and he, he operated from there. Okay, so the previous Rebbe moved to, to America, to New York, Brooklyn, Grand Heights in 1940. And so I think my grandfather was recruited pretty much after that when they started opening the Lubavitch, Chabad Lubavitch Yeshiva in Brooklyn. And I think 1941, 42, 43, he was a Yeshiva student there. And it was at the time when, when young men were being drafted into the United States Army for World War II. The previous Rebbe said that none of his students would be drafted into the army. And you have to understand, it's not about not being patriotic, but it's about, you know, they just escaped from Europe. And now to send students back into the, into the fray and to lose more was just very, many parents were very apprehensive about, about the draft. So the previous Rebbe basically gave a promise that, uh, you know, spiritual promise that everyone's all of my students will be safe and no one's going to be no one's going to be in harm's way my grandfather was in yeshiva they had they had recruited him from another yeshiva chaim berlin yeshiva in brooklyn because before the chabad yeshiva was there that's you know there was torah vadas and chaim berlin the big yeshivas and then the lavavich yeshiva started it was fledgling and so they were looking for guys my grandfather was one of the guys that they they pulled over to the yeshiva my grandfather sets up a meeting with the previous rebbe which was a, you know, a very special thing to, ha to happen. And he was asking for a blessing for his brother. His brother was not in the yeshiva. So he was in the yeshiva, his twin brother was not. His twin brother was, you know, had other interests and was doing other things. He wasn't in, in, in yeshiva. So he asked, he knew that he would be protected because of the blessing of the previous rabbi, but he was asking for his brother that he should also be protected from any harm and you know, not have to serve in the war his parents, the whole family was very, very um, nervous about this. So he meets with the previous Rebbe. The previous Rebbe tells him he's going to go in good health and he'll return in good health. And that was not the blessing that, wanted, that my grandfather wanted. He wanted that he shouldn't have to go in the first place. Not that he should go and come back in good health, but that he shouldn't go, he shouldn't be drafted. So he was very, you know, it was a, I guess it's, you know, it's a good blessing on the one hand, he'll come back healthy, but it was also a lot of still apprehension and, and nervousness about it. All right. So sure enough, he gets called in, might hit, again, not my grandfather, his twin brother, his name was David. 
So he gets called in um, to the draft office, wherever that was. It was on a Friday. He gets called in, and he was very, very healthy. My grandfather's twin brother. He was like, like a, like a, he used to lift weights and like a, not a professional, but you know, some sort of like bodybuilder. He was like into like health and wellness. But no, no problem passing all of the all of the tests and, and whatever to get to get drafted. He was very, very army fit. Let's put it that way. And again, this is like 941, 42 or 43, one of those years. So he goes to the office and they're checking him out and there's a big line and he's waiting and waiting and waiting. And then God is coming and, and he goes home and I forget the exact details of the story, but at some point he has to come home and as he walks through the door, he had to, oh, he had to walk because it was Friday. The Shabbat started, and, but he was still there. And he walks back home. They weren't finished with him. He walks back home. By the time he gets home, it was cold outside. His face, my grandfather says, his face was swollen like a pumpkin. It almost looked like he had one eye. Something happened. His face was swollen, indistinguished. Like you couldn't tell it was him. It was so like swollen and misshapen. And he opens, he knocks on the door. They open up the door. They freaked out. They didn't know who this was. They were all nervous and scared. Anyway, it was over Shabbat. Face was still, it was still, it, it didn't go down. The swelling didn't go down. It was very unusual, very, very, you know, alarming. The weekend, the weekend, the, over the weekend, same, same deal. Monday morning, he has his follow-up by the, by the draft office and his face is still swollen. They take one look at him and they say, there's something wrong with you. We don't want you. Comes back home. And my grandfather said he saw this with his own eyes. He stepped into the house. The moment he stepped into the house, his face transformed back to normal. And he said, my grandfather says, as he tells the story, and he's told it many times, he's told it here in Atlanta also. Maybe some of you have heard him tell it, but it's, it's been a few years since he's told. He said... That was the meaning of the previous Rebbe's blessing, that you'll go in good health and come back in good health. Not to, not to the war, but to the office, to the draft office. You'll come back and, and everything will be okay. And he didn't serve and everything was fine. That's the story. But I was reminded of the story as, you know, as uh, God is blessed with going out and coming back in good health. Hey, Mark. Um, I was reminded of the story of my, uh, my, my great uncle, my grandfather's twin brother. Anyway, just thought I'd share that with you. Yeah, Donna, go ahead. That made me think what I'd like to share. So my father was a young man in New York City at the time. And of course, his parents didn't want him to go, you know, for selfish reasons to go to the war. But my father said, you know, yes, I have to defend the Jews. So he volunteered and he, wow. had, he was a bombardier in the Air Force stationed in London. And he went up in the B-17 bombers. And for two minutes, he controlled the plane to the bomb site because that was the only thing that mattered, that the bombs fell on the target. So he bombed Germany. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. I got the chills. Wow. Shh. That's amazing. A hero. Yeah. A hero in the most little sense. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. So look. Thank you. Who would have thought on December 21st, it's 31st, not 21st, 31st, we're sharing war stories. <laughs> what is that? World War II stories. Anyway, um, all right, good. But it reminded me, God, you know, God is going to go into the war and help conquer the nation, conquer Israel for all the people, and then they're going to come back on their side. But again, just to just to keep the chronological concept here, this is Jacob speaking to God hundreds of years before the Exodus before the journey in the desert, before Moses. This is way back, right? This is a prophecy of what will happen with God's descendants, with the tribe of God, not the child God. He'll be long gone, but the tribe of God, they're going to be the ones that will be the troops. Hence the God, Gedud, Yigedenu. That's a kind of, in Hebrew, we would call that a plan. Well, it's a plan where it's in Hebrew. God is the name of the, of the tribe. God, Gedud, Yigedenu. Gadoji Gadeno means the troops. So God Gadoji Gadeno, who you're good, I cave. So that's uh, that's the phrase. All right, let me share the screen. Let's get back into the text. Again, we have just massive Rashis here, which we're not going to cover all of them, but just you know, here and there. So that's God. Oh, I love this one. Usher. 
right? Let's go to the next one. Usher, verse 20. From Usher will come rich food. And he will yield regal delicacies. I love that. Usher, their portion in Israel, again, this is a prophecy of what would happen centuries later. The portion of land that the tribe of Usher eventually um, settled in, that's where the olives were. That's the olive groves, and it was shmeina lachmai. Shmeina literally means shamein. It means like fat. It means like oil. It means rich. Ah, oh, that's what it's translated, rich food. Rich food, it's like, and vuhu yitain ma'adani melech. He will give, yield or give. Actually, yitain means give. He will give the, the royal delicacies. And there's a beautiful insight on this. Not only will Usher in his own portion have the delicacies, but the second half of the verse is he's going to give it to his brothers also. He's going to share his blessings. And that's really the blessing. It's an even, it's a blessing to have. It's an even greater blessing to have the opportunity to share it with others. I mean, you and I know how we feel, right? How good it feels to share our blessings with someone else. Give you a simple, like silly example. You're at a restaurant and you taste something and it's fantastic. What do you say to the nice person? Try, right? It's, 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 it feels, it feels good to be able to share. And so Usher's blessing, the blessing that Yaakov, Jacob gives to his son Usher is that not only should you have the greatest bounty, the greatest delicacies, but you should share, have the opportunity to share them as well with, uh, with, with your siblings and with others. Let's continue inside 21. Naphtali. I told you that some tribes are likened to animals. Naphtali is a swift gazelle. He is one who utters beautiful words. There you go. Swift gazelle. Um, he was a marathon runner. He was a sprinter. Now, let's see. Let's see what Rashi says. Oh. <laughs> Rashi says it's referring to the Valley of Gennesar, which is uh, the Naphtali's portion of Israel, which ripens its fruits swiftly. So it's not about running fast. It's that the, the land produces, the fruits ripen swiftly like the gazelle, which runs swiftly. But Naphtali is associated with the deer. Like, have you ever seen, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. Have you ever seen um, like stained glass windows in a synagogue? You know what I'm talking about? Like the stained glass and they have like 12 windows with 12 tribes. So you'll, you'll always see Naphtali. You'll always see one with a deer. Well, that's, uh, that's for Naphtali. That's for Naphtali's tribe. Okay. Back inside, again, there's a lot of Rashi, but we're not going to do all of it. Um, oh, you know what? Let's do one more Rashi on, on Swift Gazelle. Another explanation. Jacob prophesied concerning the war with Sisera. Sisera was one of the enemies of the Jewish people after they settled the land of Israel. So it says in the book of... Um, it says in the book of Judges in Shoftim... And take with you ten thousand men of the men, men of the men of Naphtali. So they were told specifically to go to draft. Speaking of wars and drafts, to draft ten thousand men from Naphtali. And there and they went there with alacrity. And so it stated there an expression of dispatching into the valley. They rushed forth with their feet. So Naphtali, not only the, do the fruits ripen swiftly, but also when they came to this war with Sisera, they were able. They, they were they were very um, very quick. And, uh, and moving fast on it. Let's continue. Joseph. Ah, Joseph. Let's, let's see what, what, what Jacob says to his son, Joseph. A charming son is Joseph. Yeah, you wouldn't expect anything less, right? A charming son is Joseph. A son charming to the eye. Of the women, each one strode along to see him. <laughs> Do you understand what he's saying here? <laughs> the women didn't mind looking at Joseph. He was a handsome guy. You could see there's a twinkle in, 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 in Jacob's final words to Joseph or about Joseph, to Joseph. You could, you could almost tell the twinkle in his eye as he talks about his beloved son, Joseph. Um, what a great, charming man, a ladies' man. <laughs> it's interesting that he mentions that, right? In his final words, to, to, you know, final blessing to, to Joseph. A few things, though, to, to mention this. It says, a son charming to the eye. 
So this alludes to the fact that Yosef was impervious, was a good deflector of the evil eye. You know the evil eye, right? The Ayin Hara, the evil eye. Um, I, there was even an article written recently in the Jewish Times. Did anybody see that? I was uh, interviewed for this article about super Jewish superstitions. So I had we had a nice conversation about evil eyes. I'm sure you can find it on the Jewish Times website or Facebook page or in print, either way. Um, so it says that a son charming to the eye refers to his ability, Yosef's ability to ward off, to you know, push away, if you will, the evil eye. Um, let's see if there's a Rashi on this. Uh, hold on, a chat's coming through. Ah, son of grace. His grace is spread out. Good, good, yeah. So he was uh, graceful. His chain was, was ever present. Let's see if we have another insight here. Charming, yes. His charm attracts the eye that beholds him. Good. But again, I'm telling you a little bit of a, a more mystical explanation about the eye and heart, about the evil eye. Um, Rashi says, the women of Egypt strode out on the wall to gaze upon his beauty. Of the women, each one strode to a place from which she could catch a glimpse of him. Okay. Fine. Um, oh. There's another beautiful Rashi here. Ah, oh, here we go. Here we go. This is what I was referring to. To gaze at you and your... Okay, they, the rabbis, interpreted further as referring to the idea that the evil eye should have no influence over his descendants. You see that? It's right here. From the Midrash, quoted in Rashi. Right? The last Rashi on this verse. That the evil eye should not have an influence over the tribe, the children of Joseph. Also, when Jacob blessed Menashe and Ephraim, he blessed them that they should be like fish, over which the evil eye has no influence. Ah, oh, so now we get into fish. I was hoping we would get to fish. We ended up with the fish. So what does this mean? says, part of the blessing, which we read a few days ago, that Jacob gave to his grandsons, Menashe and Ephraim. Remember he switched the hands and he blessed them? So he blessed them that they should be like fish. Or there's a Hebrew word that could also mean fish. Dog, fish. Um, so one explanation is that they should multiply, like fish multiply apply you know very rapidly they spawn a lot of offspring so that's one explanation the other explanation is just like fish fish are always sleeping fish eyes are always open correct is that correct biologically fish don't have eyelids yeah that's what we were always taught fish the eyes are always open so the metaphorically it it it, it represents the idea that our eyes should always be open and no evil eye no like mm, you know no evil eye should, should take effect on us. That's why one of the reasons why we go to Tashlech on, on Rosh Hashanah and cast... Oh, is that, Ray, was that what you were going to say? <laughs> yes. We're on the same page here. Look at that. I'm reading the time. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why we go to Tashlech. We go to a body of water and ceremoni cer uh, ceremoniously cast away our sins, but it's specifically to a body of water that has fish. Why? Because it's not just about casting away our sins. It's also about getting a blessing on Rosh Hashanah that no evil eye should befall us. We shouldn't have, nothing should harm us this year, um, you know, from an evil eye perspective. And that's the blessing that was given to Joseph. It's a good blessing. It's a good blessing. By the way, evil eye, just to, to, to explain what that is, that's essentially when somebody looks at someone else and begrudges their blessings. You know, like, mm, why does that person have that? I want that. Or, you know, I hope they, God, God forbid, right? We should never do this, but no one should ever do this for us. But somebody looks at somebody else and wishes them ill. And that's, you know, certainly not a good thing. Judaism believes that that could have a negative effect. So we have to be careful with doing that. And we also try to ward it away. That's why we say Kainahara, right? Which, which means, Kain, which is really Kain Ayanhara. May there not be an evil eye present in the situation. Okay. Rabbi, yeah. Isn't also that on at Tashlech, um, we say may Hashem's eyes always be open like the fishes and watch over us. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Yes, yes. We also say that Hashem should watch over us and should always, you know, be ever present in our lives and ever aware and watchful over us, like the fish who don't close their eyes. Exactly. 
And all of this is kind of included in the Joseph blessing. He gets the blessing. Manash and Ephraim get their blessing. His children get their blessing. We read about that before. And he gets the blessing also of, uh, of no evil eye. So it's, it seems to be a very powerful Joseph experience. Okay, let's share once again and get back inside. Okay. Um, oh, there we go. They heap bitterness upon him and became quarrelsome. Well, you probably know who that is. Who heaped bitterness upon Joseph? <laughs> His brothers, right? His brothers were bitter and became quarrelsome. Yeah, archers despised him. Archers despised him. Let's see what Rashi says about archers. Um, archers despised him. Yeah, it refers to the brothers. Their tongues were like arrows. Their tongues were like arrows. You know what that means, tongues were like arrows? I'll tell you what that means. You know, sometimes we think that what we say doesn't have an effect, right? Sticks and stones may break my, my, may break my bones, but names will never hurt me or something like that. That's never been true because the words do have an effect. Like an arrow. What's an arrow? An arrow is, I'm standing here. I didn't go to you. I'm not hurting you, but I'm just shooting an arrow. Does that cause damage? Of course it causes damage, right? Back in the day, this is before guns, right? So arrows were the only long distance way of, of, of warfare. This is before missiles and cannons and all that stuff, right? So an arrow is symbolic of long distance warfare. So um, the arrow is I can be standing here and pretending to mind my own business and not be involved with you. But meanwhile, I can be shooting an arrow to you. That's the same thing that's likened to words. Our words are like arrows. We're in one place. And we're not physically, you know, touching someone, but our words are being directed and shot over to another to hurt them. And that's not okay. And that's what it means as Jacob is reflecting on Joseph's life. He talks about his charm and how all the women came out to see him. That refers to, by the way, when he was inaugurated as the second in command and he had the parade. All the women were, you know, looking by the wall, by the fence to, to catch a glimpse of this handsome, dashing young Hebrew or maybe they didn't know he was a Hebrew, but this dashing young man, this Safnas Paneach dude. So that's one thing. And then he says, the brothers plotted against you and uh, uh, um, archers despised him. In other words, the archers, the brothers that shot their words like, like, uh, like arrows, they despised him. Ari. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I've got a nice note from Voracious Rabba, pretty much saying what you said. It said uh, Psalms uh, and Jeremiah, the, uh, that location, compare malicious talk to shooting arrows and that both can cause harm to another from a distance. Joseph right. was a victim of malicious talk on the part of his brothers and on the part of the Egyptians. Furthermore, just as an arrow kills from afar, so the brothers conspired to kill Joseph from afar. That's what you were saying. Yeah, yeah that excellent. Problem. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, 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 it, and it really reminds us of how careful we need to be with our words and how words do matter. And it's not just, oh, I didn't do anything. I just said something, not so fast. You say something and that itself has, has an effect God, you know, for the good or the opposite. And it can inspire other people to do things. Because if you think about it on a very literal level, how does Joseph become kidnapped and sold? It's because when he was approaching, they started talking amongst themselves. Oh, here comes, remember they said, here comes the dreamer. And whoever said that, here comes the dreamer, that was the beginning of the end. That was it. Because, uh, oh, yeah, uh, uh, you begin talking, conspiring, and the next thing you know, they're doing something physical to him also. But it begins with words. And so we have to be very careful. Uh, but the good news, as Jacob continues, but his bow was strongly established. And his arms were gilded from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there, he sustained the rock of Israel which means that despite the attempts to hurt him, Joseph was strong, Joseph was blessed by God, and in Egypt, he sustained the rock of Israel. In other words, he provided food for all of us. Right? Jacob is basically re recounting the arc of the, the Joseph story. Um, yeah, Rashi says, interestingly, the rock of Israel, Evan, Yisrael, the Hebrew word is Evan, Yisrael, rock of Israel, Evan is a contraction of Av. Look at, look at the Hebrew, if you, if you will. 
Av is Alf Bet, which means father, and Ben is son. Evan could be Av and Ben. It's a contraction, right? The first two letters are Av. This, the last two letters are Ben. Father, mother. Together it means rock or stone. But Rashi says, split it back out. Av and Ben, he was the one who sustained the fathers and children of Israel. In other words, he sustained our family with food in Egypt. So here you have a beautiful, again, not, not a literal interpretation, but these, you know, these beautiful uh, um, deeper explanations of this very evocative, um, these evocative blessings. Okay, sorry, I'm just scrolling back up to toggle Rashi off so that it's a little bit cleaner. Let's continue. Ah, let's continue. 20, verse 25. From the God of your father, and he will help you. And with the Almighty, and he will bless you with the blessings of the heavens above, the blessings of the deep lying below, the blessings of father and mother. Basically, what he's saying is, Joseph... You should be showered with blessings from all angles, above and below, father and mother, me and your mother. You should be inundated with blessings. You can see here how many verses Joseph get. I'm not saying he's still playing favorite. I'm just saying you see how many verses are dedicated to Joseph in this final message to his sons. Next, 26, the blessings of your father surpass the blessings of my parents the ends of the everlasting hills. May they come to Joseph's head and to the crown of the head of the one who was separated from his brothers. Yeah, that's Joseph. Joseph was the one who was separated from his brothers. So again, he's directing massive, beautiful blessings toward Joseph and Joseph's, uh, Joseph's direction. Let me see if there's any interesting Rashi that we can uh, quickly quote. Um, yeah. It says, God helped you. It says, but yeah, your heart was with the Holy One, blessed be he, when you did not heed your mistress's orders. And because of this, he shall bless you. So Jacob alludes to, I don't know how he knew about this, maybe through prophecy, maybe they had a schmooze about it, but he alludes to Potiphar's wife and the seduction and, and the temptation and the fact that he was able to, to withstand that test. And because of this, God will continue to bless you. Um... Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if there's anything else here. Ah, oh, we have French. Ta'avat. Asso. I don't know what that is. Asosomals. You got me. I don't know if that's any new French. That seems like old French. Um, ends and bounds. Okay. Just scrolling through, seeing if there's anything. Again, the temptation of Potiphar's wife and his was withholding that. Um, let's, so let's do the, the last Rashi. According to this interpretation, the phrase is rendered by the hand of the might of Jacob. He was able to overcome his temptation. Oh, because his father's image appeared to him as related in the Talmud, the tractate Sota. We discussed that before when he was tempted into sinning with Potiphar's wife. He saw his father and he stopped. Um, the end of the verse is explained as follows. From there, he merited to be the shepherd of Israel and to have a stone among the stones of the tribe of Israel on the breastplate of the high priest. Oh, Donna, speaking of the breastplate stones, right? Had Joseph sinned, he would have been lost. His tribe would have been lost. And then we would only have 11 stones on the breastplate, which would have thrown off the whole symmetry of the workshop and the symmetry of the breastplate, because how do you have 11 stones lined up? Everything is, it's a fashion disaster at that point. Thank God Joseph didn't sin. So we have, but you know what, what else the point is? It's a really powerful point. It's the, and I, I mentioned this before, it's that no one's individual actions are insignificant. We should never say, well, it's just me just doing one thing. No, it has everlasting, it has eternal effect. One action that we do has far reaching implications. And so, what that means on a very practical level is that, Joseph, not sinning, was able to maintain his, uh, his stone in the breastplate. And, and it was a significant, significant um, withholding of his actions. Um, Rabbi? Rabbi? Yeah. I just I yeah. Came on something recently at Chabad.org. It's called Colors in the Soul. 
and they oh, nice. it's, it's very interesting they talk about blue white purple and scarlet and how hasidic teachings explain the sanctuary is not only a physical building but also within the heart and they say how the colors of the sanctuary of the heart and they, they give oh, nice. the, yeah they give the reasons why blue scarlet purple and white so send me send me that link i'd love to read it i'd love to read it um, I was also thinking along those lines, what was I thinking? Oh, um, whatever, just put, to put on the, to put on the radar at some point to maybe do a class, maybe on colors, but also maybe on the four elements, yeah. fire, water, earth, and, uh, and wind. So like the band, yeah. earth, wind, and f fire or something. We also have water. Anyway, so yeah, lots of lots of cool stuff. Um, all right, so that's that's it for today. Tomorrow we're gonna the plan is that we'll have class tomorrow on New Year's Day. We'll start 2021 with uh, with the Torah with the Torah blast, and the plan is we're gonna finish off the Torah portion. We'll do reading six and seven. We'll read about Joseph, uh, Jacob's passing and Joseph's passing, and it sets the stage for Monday, where slavery begins. It's, I mean, it's next week is a book of Exodus. It begins with a very short hop from, you know, as we've discussed this week, from the Jews being, you know, those that saved Egypt to being, you know, we're done with you, unfortunately. And that's, uh, that's what we're going to get into next week. The book that we're entering, the book of Exodus, is... It, it's it's going to be mind-blowing. It's going to be incredible, this journey each day going through the, the reading. So happy that you're with me and happy to, to have these opportunities to study. All right, any questions, comments on today's Torah? Anybody? Okay, good. No. I seem to, to Rayenu, I never pay attention. I don't know if it's new, but on top of Rashi, they say also Onkelos, which... Yes. It's the Aramaic, it. Yeah, it's the Aramaic translation. Wait, are they translating it or they have it in the original um, Aramaic? Mm, they have is it in it? the original under the English and Hebrew text of the Torah, but then they, they give a lot of uh, commentaries. Are that. they commenting on, on Uncleus or, or they're just having it there in the original? They, they have it in the, in the original and then they comment on it. They say right. Rashi thinks that, and Onkelos says that. That's interesting. That might be new. Yeah, that, yeah. That's very yes. interesting. So Onkelos is 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 officially a translation of the Torah into Aramaic from a fellow who converted to Judaism. Very interesting story, Onkelos. He was not born a Jew. He converted, and he authored this this really beautiful um, uh, a translation of Torah. But his translation is not just a translation. There's also commentary in the translation. So, and Rashi quotes Uncleus a lot. Rashi says, Uncleus says this, and I say this, and whatever. And, and there's a lot to learn from it. But it's not used. I mean, it's rarely studied by most people. So it's kind of cool that they put that into the Chayenu. Very cool. Nice. Sandrine, is that a real cat behind you or not a real cat? Oh, that is a real, oh yes. my gosh. That's legit. <laughs> It's like it a twin. It's a twin, yeah. It's a French cat. <laughs> they, they look the same. They're just cats. Always dressed for the occasion. Uh -huh. is awesome. Yeah, and he loves to go up there because there's a heat come come, you know, right above. I don't blame him. So <laughs> what's what's the cat's name? Snowy. Mine is Snowy. Beau. Mine is Beau, which means handsome in French. Bo? Nice. He's like Joseph. Hey, Bo and Jolie, that's a good <laughs> pair. <laughs> See that? And and the and the cat in Pittsburgh is cloudy. Cloudy? I don't think. No, it's cloudy. I think that's the that's the name. Anyway, what are you gonna do? Or a cat. It's, it's a cat's world. We're just, you know, in it. Uh, Rabbi, it I need to leave now. Okay, we're gonna do the Zoom. Oh. All right. Yes. Thank you. All right. Enjoy we'll see you. Plan. Bye, Ray. Yeah. Happy birthday to Lily. All right. Please.
We'll Thank see you, you soon. Bye, Ray. Thank you very Take much. Care. Thank you. All right, I'll sign off also. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the last day of 2020. 2021 should bring lots of blessings. We'll see you all very soon. Take care. Zayn Gazun, be healthy. All right. Bye, you Take too. care, everybody. Bye, Mark. Bye, Donna. Bye, Sandrine. Bye, Ray.